like to next uh, welcome Dr. Wilson Lamb. He's from here in Houston, but at Baylor College of Medicine, and he's going to discuss um, bicuspid aortic valve. Thank you. All righty. Thank you, Dr. Phillips. Thank you to Huey, and thanks to everyone for being here today at the fourth annual Methodist ACHD Symposium. So in the next 15 minutes, I get the chance to teach you everything you need to know in 2018 about bicuspid aortic valves. I promise it's going to be I'm going to try to keep it pretty simple. So there are only three things you have to know about bicuspid aortic valves. It's a valvulopathy. It affects the valve. It's an aortopathy. You have to think about it downstream. And I'm glad that Dr. McGillivray had gotten a way to lead off all the things distal to me. And then it's heredity. If you remember those three things, and we're going to cite a few of the guidelines and the review articles, you'll know everything you have to know. So we're going to start off. 10 years ago with the 2008 guidelines and how they've progressed. We'll talk about the valve guidelines that came out in 2014, the aortopathy guidelines and the interventional guidelines that came out in 2011 and 2010, a couple of review articles out of the New England Journal of Medicine and the Journal of the American College of Cardiology, and lastly, we'll finish off with the 2018 updated adult congenital heart disease guidelines. So. As a valvulopathy, I like to say bicuspidic valves, by bi means two. So if you can remember the number two, everything follows the story of two, and don't let them tell you otherwise. So it's 0.5 to 2% of the population. Some say it's 1.3%. I tell everybody it's 2%, because that's what by bi is. It's easy to remember. And then I say it's two to one male to female ratio, because again, two is easier to remember than 70-30 or 80-20. Most often, it's the fusion of the right and left cusps, the intercoronary cusp. And roughly 2% of the 2% requires an intervention in the first two decades of life. See how the theme of two carries along? As you can see on these echocardiograms, there is eccentric closure of this thickened aortic valve. And this is an example that shows the aortic insufficiency that's coming down the peristernal long axis view. As you look at the short axis view, you can see now fusion of this right and left intercommissural uh, cusps. And then uh, the opening is slightly more stenotic. We don't see that here, but we see the aortic insufficiency as the, as the valve closes. As we listen to the physical exam, this opening of the thickened valve gives us that early high-pitched peri S1 click. I like to feel the pulse of the radial artery as I'm listening, just to get a, a good association. You can hear the aortic stenosis murmur, or the pulse if it becomes uh, stenotic, parvocet tardis, and then the aortic insufficiency murmur, or the pulse if it becomes severely insufficient. A classic echo board question for the cardiologists out there is this eccentric closure, that usually the closure should happen down the middle in a three-cusp uh, three valve. If you have a bicuspid, bicommissural aortic valve, you see that the closure is pulled off to a side. When are we thinking about intervening? Usually, again, it's two decades before the tricommissural valves in the, aortic, uh, in the adult congenital heart disease population, and especially once it starts becoming calcific. If you look at those 2011 guidelines by Dr. Uh, with uh, Tim Felty's chairing that, we tend to intervene if it's 40 to 50 millimeters of mercury uh, and their symptoms, or if they want to compete in sports or considering pregnancy. If there's EKG changes, we might give it 50 to 60 millimeters of mercury. And a lot of times, they give a little fudge factor because some of these are done under general anesthesia, which may reduce or, uh, or mitigate some of that uh, gradient. And it can be used as a bridge if the patient is hemodynamically unstable if you want to get them to a therapeutic surgery or a transcatheter aortic valve. For surgical repair, I usually follow the aortic stenosis and aortic regurgitation guidelines from the 2014 ACC AHA. Your options essentially are, can you get a decent, size, decent repair, which I will talk to in a multidisciplinary approach with our surgeons. The debate between the mechanical aortic valves in the younger patient versus a bioprosthetic tissue valve, 
And then you can't talk about the bicuspidic valve without talking about the ROS procedure. The 2018 updates to the ACHD guidelines agree that a bicuspidic valve that's stenotic and non-calcified, we can consider doing balloon uh, valvuloplasty um, once we've already uh, hit all of our goal-directed medical therapy. So the ROS procedure. If you guys haven't heard about it, it's basically taking the patient's current pulmonary valve, assuming that it's of decent size and no significant uh, disease or insufficiency, placing it over into the aortic position, and then putting a homograph into the pulmonary position. So we're taking the patient's pulmonary valve, moving it on over, reimplanting the coronary cusp, and then putting a uh, homograph into the pulmonary position. And a recent review, a 25-year follow-up, from uh, Dr. Martin, looked at over 300 patients, and roughly 20 years is the 50% half-life of degeneration. Fortunately, only half of those require a re-intervention in this 25-year follow-up. So it gives us a little bit more longevity than our typical bioprosthetic valves that might get us 10 to 15 years, but perhaps not as long as our mechanical valves if they end up being on Coumadin and aspirin. But you're probably thinking about the transcatheter aortic valves. Is the future now? Is the past coming to become present? This review uh, in the Journal of American College of Cardiology looked at, it was over 500 patients with bicuspid aortic valves, comparing it to over 4,000 patients who had tricomatural aortic valves. And they looked at them uh, getting the transcatheter aortic valve replacement. And more of them ended up converting the surgery to versus 0.2%, although the mortality was the same. There was a little bit more root injury, more paravalvular leak, and, but the newer models of the transcatheter valves were actually more neutral in terms of their results. It seems that we got better with the newer models. Following that, there was this New England Journal paper that came out last year, again, not in the era of transcatheter aortic valves, that looked at mechanical and bioprosthetic valves and uh, looked at the mortality difference after 25 years, and the number needed to harm, there was a 4% absolute risk increase in mortality in those who had tissue valves, although there was higher stroke and bleeding in those who used the mechanical valves. So it is the trade-off that we have to consider, but no, remember, this was all before the advent of the newer technology. This came out of that Jack paper. You'll see that the older models of the transcatheter aortic valves, it's worse for bicuspid aortic valves. The median age in this population was 77 years old. Whereas the newer models, it looks like they figured out the solutions. You have uh, the conversions to surgery, paravalvular leak, absence of significant stenosis, and the pacemakers are still staying roughly the same in both populations. From the New England Journal article, it's the younger population, the 45 to 50 year old, who ends up having that mortality increase in the biologic valve compared to the mechanical, but our older patients, it's a wash. So the older patient, likely still going with the bioprosthetic valve, makes sense, particularly in the day that we can do TAVRs into our surgically placed aortic valve replacements. How do I follow them? Essentially, the 2008 ACHD guidelines gave some parameters of how often that we should be looking with EKG and echocardiogram, depending on how significant the gradients were across the valve, more for stenosis, and different times that we could use some other modalities, such as catheterization, treadmills, CTMRI, and stress echoes. The 2014 guidelines for uh, valve disease essentially got incorporated into the 2018 ACHD guidelines, so milder disease every three to five years, moderate severity every one to two years, severe disease every uh, six months to 12 months, and then if there's a significant dilation, uh, at least every year. It's an aortopathy. So this New England Journal article by Verma and Sue from 2014 basically lets us predict where we expect the root dilation and the ascending aortic dilation will be, it's in essentially at least half the patients. But you have to think, when are we gonna intervene on them? A lot of people are trying beta blockers and angiotensin receptor blockers. There was a trial that went from 2011 through the uh, mid 2000 teens in Canada that was looking at this, the BAV trial. Uh, essentially, when you talk about surgery though, it's 5.5 centimeters for all comers. And if there's high risk factors such as rapid growth by more than 0.5 centimeters per year, or a family history of dissection or rupture, you might cut at five centimeters. And if you're gonna intervene on the valve surgically, then you might cut on the aorta at 4.5 centimeters. 
When we talk about all the other various surveillance of the aortas, whether it's the uh, aortopathy guidelines, the adult congenital guidelines, the valve guidelines, the Bethesda sports guidelines, or the pregnancy guidelines, early on in 2008 to 2010, we were more aggressive about surveillance, doing annual imaging earlier, starting semi-annual at about 4.5 centimeters. The 2014 guidelines came out, and in that controversial period, they said, maybe we're looking too often. Maybe you start your surveillance around 4 centimeters and your annual surveillance at uh, 4.5 centimeters. Sports guidelines, if they're under 4 centimeters, I let them participate in all sports. And then as they increase in size, you start to limit the uh, possibility of, of trauma on there and go with low and moderate exercise, and only low intensity once they're above 4.5. And, and the 2018 European Society of Cardiology pregnancy guidelines essentially tell us that if they're greater than 5 centimeters, we should operate before we send them to, uh, to consider pregnancy, watch them closely if they're above 4.5, and everyone requires at least a little attention if they're uh, less than 4.5. We've already heard about the coarctation of the aorta. It comes in the majority of patients. Uh, the majority of patients will also have a bicuspid aortic valve. And thoracic aorta imaging is required at least every five years, more frequently if we see things such as the hypertension or uh, symptoms or a gradient. Head imaging, at least once in the adulthood, has been downgraded in the 2018 guidelines from a class 1 indication to a class 2B indication. I think that matches what we're seeing in the population. It may not be as high as the 10% that's previously quoted. And then the uh, Turner Society met in 2016, and they said for patients with Turner syndrome, at least 10% of them have a bicuspid aortic valve. If it's greater than 2.5 centimeters indexed to their body surface area in metered squared, consider intervention on the uh, aorta. And that's consistent with the 2018 ACHD guidelines that gave that a 2A indication to intervene on the aorta if it's dilated to a diameter greater than 2.5 centimeters per metered squared. Pregnancy, again, the 2011-2018 guidelines that were just updated from the Europeans runs very parallel to our guidelines from the AHA scientific statement. At four and a half, uh, less than four and a half, we're, we're watching. Four and a half to five, we're watching closely and individualizing whether or not they should consider a C-section. And greater than five centimeters, definitely give them a recommendation of operating before. Your OBs, your MFMs do not want to see a five centimeter aorta. Mild and moderate. Uh, Eric's stenosis or severe asymptomatic is usually well tolerated, and you could consider exercise testing, but they're probably going to make it on through. Counsel against severe uh, uh, Eric's stenosis, pregnancy again, if there's severe Eric's stenosis with symptoms, and if you ca get, are caught in the middle of pregnancy, that's where you can consider the balloon aortic valvuloplasty or, in dire circumstances, aortic valve replacement in the second trimester. But an early C section is usually recommended. I'll close off with the heredity. So if you look through uh, Dr. Sue and Dr. Silverside's Jack uh, State of the Art Review, almost 10 years old now, they go through a lot of the genetics, whether it's the Notch 1, the Acta 2 mutations, fibrillin, and the uh, metal, uh, uh, matrix proteins. It's the matrix disruption that leads to uh, unusual or incomplete delamination of the aortic valve. And so if it's 2% in the general population, Single family members have almost a 10% chance of having a bicuspidic valve, and if two family members have it, then anyone who's first degree related to them have roughly a one in four chance of having. So the 2010 guidelines gave it a class one indication of doing a, an echo or some sort of CTMR to look at the ascending aorta as well. Later review articles started to say, what's the cost efficacy? We're not sure. So the 2018 ACHD guidelines gives it a 2A indication downgraded from a class 1 indication of looking at first degree relatives. In closing, when you're thinking about a bicuspid aortic valve in the young person, listen for the click. If you hear a murmur of aortic stenosis or aortic insufficiency, then that will usually prompt you to go for your surveillance echocardiogram. The special populations of Turner we may be more aggressive. Think about the coarctation that's associated. Ascending aorta dilation, that's the one that, that uh, routine surveillance of the family might be there. Because you were, you're going to hear the, the murmur on exam. There's going to be a family history of, of dissections or ruptures. But the ascending aortic dilation, that's the one that could be silent, but oftentimes comes along with aortic insufficiency. It happens earlier that you may have to intervene, whether we repair them, the Ross procedure, or surgical or transcatheteric valves, that's coming down the pipeline. And aortopathy, there are different cut points. Pregnancy, 
rapid growth and family history? Are the cut points at five centimeters versus if they're going to end up having an operation on their aortic valve? And then the Turner syndrome cutoff is here. Screen all first degree a relatives. That's the 2A indication. Valve, aorta, heredity. And that is what you need to know as of 2018. With that, I'll say bye-bye. <laughs>